Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we will take a look at the Sultanate faction, especially through the Sultanate starter set, which has been released in January. We will take a look at this faction and how to start it. First, we'll talk a bit about the fluff and the Sultanate playstyle in general. Then we'll have a look at what exactly is inside this Sultanate starter set. We will talk about each variant that you can build with the Sultanate starter set and it is quite important because there are lots of different variations and some very unique combination that you can make so it's good to have a look at this. Uh, then I will offer you a couple uh, lists uh, when you want to learn the game and then you want to be a bit more competitive etc. And finally we will have a look at what other boxes you can buy on top of this one if you want to expand your forces of the Sultanate what goes good with uh, the starter set and what maybe is not such a good purchase. So first things first, what is actually the Sultanate? Well, it is actually represented on the map in this green area. So they are a uh, little bit of a uh, religious state. Uh, of course, it's basically all the Muslim countries, uh, but they are quite progressive. Uh, there is actually uh, a quite like a division between the very traditionalist uh, visions in the Sultanate and some uh, views that are very much uh, progressive and uh, technology oriented etc etc so there is really this uh, division and it has been uh, reinforced this division recently because the Sultanate has allied itself with the order and the order uh, for those who play uh, Wild West Exodus are a faction composed uh, sometimes of humans and sometimes of uh, extraterrestrial influences. Um, to make it simple and uh, not go too much into the lore deep dive of this subject, there is an alien entity known as the Hex that has influenced the history of Earth, which partially led to the dystopian age. And the Order is here to counter the Hex. And to do this, they have a plan and they uh, use nations uh, through their influence to fight the X, and the Order has found its most powerful ally for now in the form of the Sultanate. And the Order having some, let's say, alien technologies, like angelic technologies, you could say, uh, they have some very, very powerful ships. And this is how the Sultanate has gained some of their generators, such as portal generators especially. And uh, yeah, so it's quite interesting to have this uh, division, and it's very cool uh, faction, um, visually wise and fluff wise and just very very interesting faction so how do they pl uh, how do they play actually uh, the thing is the sultanate is probably the most mobile faction of the game they have a lot of tricks uh, we did an orbept uh, deep dive uh, some uh, weeks uh, ago some months ago actually now and uh, we talked about every entry in the orbit and every rule etc so if you want to have a deeper understanding have a look there but basically they can be where they want when they want uh, this whole thing about drift and having to anticipate etc yeah no they don't care they just go where they, w where they want to be and they are very fast in general so that is really good uh, but the <laughs> counterpart is that they are quite uh, fragile more fragile than most other factions so you need to make sure that uh, you are in the right place where you want to be so your opponent cannot shoot at you uh, as he wants to be, uh, as he wants to do. And uh, this means that this faction has a quite high ceiling. Uh, if you are good at the game, uh, then you will be very, very strong with the Sultanate. However, there is also a high floor, which means that if you are just learning the game, it might be a little bit trickier because if you just stay in the middle of the table in front of your opponent, uh, usually this is a type of engagement that the um, Sultanate can not win. Uh, if you go just in front of a Russian fleet, uh, they will be very happy and you will die very fast and you will not do a lot of damage. So really the thing about the Sultanate is that they like to go where their opponent cannot uh, use their weaponries against them and they like to be in the uh, bend range that the opponent is bad at and uh, they are quite average at every range so the, this means that you play on your opponent's weakness rather than your own strength your own strength is your mobility and it means that you can uh, go where you want to be 
They have, of course, a lot of tricks with portals, especially. They are very good at teleporting stuff, teleporting their weaponry so they can shoot further, teleporting their ships. So there is a lot of uh, um, subtle plays that you can make there. But basically, know that it takes a little bit of learning to play this faction well. However, uh, it makes you learn the game very fast because uh, you, you will quickly have to use all the rules of the game, especially the mobility rules. And this means it's a very good faction to learn the game. Yes, you might lose your first couple games, but then you will be very, very good uh, in the entire mobility phase of the game. So what do you actually get inside this starter set? Well, you have a lot of stuff as we are uh, used to with starter sets. First, you have the Anatolia Heavy Battle Cruiser which is right here. It's not really a battleship, uh, as we will see, but it is very interesting, and it has two named variants, which are both very interesting and powerful. Then you have two Turkish frontline cruisers, which are those here, and two Turkish support cruisers, which are those there. And as you can see from here, there are a lot of variants um, with which you can build them, uh, either the frontline or the support cruisers. And I said in the one of the latest video that uh, probably it is one uh, the Japanese faction was one with the most uh, variations uh, probably the Sultanate uh, gives them a run for their money you also get four Tamir frigates very good ships that you have right here and you do want a lot of, a lot of those and you have four Ferric escorts tokens which are those that you can see right here uh, also very interesting and the Sultanate has quite a few ways to boost those you also get two Celes tokens because you can have some uh, aircraft carriers, great. And uh, as we are used to with the starter sets, you have some dice, some cards, movement tools, tokens, rule books, and even a map of the world. So you do get a lot of value for 60 pounds. And yes, the starter sets are really meant to uh, give you a lot of value if you want to uh, dip a toe in the game. And yeah, you do have a lot of stuff. And it, as we will see for the list, uh, you can already make uh, an entire list at 700, 750 points, which is the default low uh, point size value for games. And you can absolutely do this already just with this fleet. So that is good. Now that we've said this, let's have a deeper look at what uh, you can build with each variations. Uh, first thing is that the Anatolia, as we said, has three variants, one generic and two named. Uh, what is the case for the generic uh, Anatolia is that it costs 230 points, which is uh, less than some of the other battleships that we've seen, but that is because the Anatolia is not a battleship, it is a heavy battle cruiser, uh, kind of like the Oriflamme of the French. Uh, it has only two uh, heavy gun batteries to the front, and it has two small gun batteries to the rear. Uh, that is not great indeed, however it gets uh, focused gunnery, which means plus two dices and rerolling blanks on one attack with uh, gunnery quality. Uh, that is quite good and it means your frontal uh, uh, firepower is almost as good uh, as a, heavy, like a normal battleship with three heavy gun batteries, except if you planned on using a heavy firepower, in which case, yeah, it would be more efficient with a battleship. However, uh, remember that the Anatolia is quite cheap and, and, and it is extremely mobile as all the Sultanate usually is. And this is going to be the big difference is that it has a relatively tanky stat lines, at least for the Sultanate, with Armor 8 Citadel 15, which is fine. Uh, hull point 7 before it degrades, it's also fine. And uh, all the Sultanate ships have, uh, like most Sultanate ships, sorry, have a rule called Oracle Site Construction, which means that when you make them double citadel, uh, you don't cause a catastrophic explosion. It's just like forgotten, like, no, we don't care about this. So this allows you to have your ships, which usually have a very low citadel value, a little bit more extra tanky. But the Anatolia doesn't really need this because it has citadel 15, which is a very honorable value. So yeah, Anatolia, 230 points, a good ship. You can upgrade it depending on uh, with some alternative weapons, especially the particle beamers, which really leans into this strategy of staying at the range that your opponent hates. Uh, it's a good ship. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, it is not a battleship. Don't put it in the middle, expecting it to tank the entire firepower of the opponent's fleet, but uh, it will do the business and can really hold its own. Then you have the Valide Kosem. I'm sorry if I pronounce it bad. Uh, this is an upgrade for the Anatolia. It costs a lot more, 35 points more, which is 
a lot, but you do gain two massive bonuses. First, you gain Fortress of War, which is very, very good. Uh, when you start to play a higher points value, uh, it is mandatory, I would say, to have Fortress of War. And even at lower points value, like 750 or 1000 points, if you have Fortress of War and your opponent doesn't, then it's really, really going to be a big advantage for you. And it, the Valid Kosem gets Sharp Shooter. And a sharpshooter is absolutely huge. It gives minus two to the citadel of your opponent. And when you combine this with um, focus gunnery and some respectable firepower, uh, it means that if you manage to engage the enemy in the right angle, for example, on the flank, uh, you're going to absolutely devastate him between your two uh, heavy gun batteries, your small gun battery, and <laughs> focus gunnery plus sharpshooter, like they're going to take uh, criticals even if you shoot. At about shift, so that is very good. However, the defensive uh, stat line of the Valid Kosem is the same as the Anatolia, so it costs 35 points more. It's not more survivable, so it makes it more of a glass cannon. However, for the point cost, 35 points is a lot, but if you do manage, I would highly recommend keeping it, especially if you don't have another source of Fortune of War in your list. If you do have another source of Fortune of War, then yeah, you can consider not taking it. Uh, however, if you don't, then yeah mandatory very good ship and then you have the dogan uh, dogan is uh, a little bit cheaper than the valid kosem it's 25 points more than the anatolia and it has to trade one of its frontal heavy gun battery for portal generator which is a bit uh, sad uh, however what it does gain is a uh, portal focus which means that between the portal generator and portal focus it can create two portal tokens uh, meaning that it's uh, self-sustained and it can use it uh, to do a few things. I'm not going to go too much in details with the portals. Have a look at our detailed uh, Sultanate Orbat review if you want to learn more about it. Uh, however, you know, this means that you can uh, open a portal, shoot through it, especially with your heavy broadside. Even better if you have an attached unit that can link its broadside as well. And that is going to be very powerful. And the very, very th fun thing that the Dogan can do is it can make a boarding action through the portal. And that, it, first of all, it's super thematic. They have these sort of commandos that just jump through the portal to teleport away and board an enemy ship. That is so cool. And uh, the interesting thing is boarding actions do not close the portals, unlike the attack through heavy broadsides, for example, which actually close the portals after the uh, shooting has been done. Uh, the boarding does not. So you can use either the Dogan as a self-centered ship it uh, opens uh, a portal it shoots it every broadside and that's it uh, which is already already fine very fine or you can think like the dogan is going to open portals for other ships for example we're going to talk later of artillery ships such as the mirima or the nemrut and those ships need portals to be efficient the dogan absolutely can be the source of portals for them so meaning the Dogen will just open the portals, just do a boarding action through it, but not through its heavy broadside through the portals, and leave the portals for the Mirimao, the Nemroots, or all the ships with this big artillery that needs portals, we'll talk about it later, um, and it will leave the portals for those. So overall, a very cool ship, depends how you want to use it, um, and depends on the rest of your list. It's a little bit less auto-include than the Valide Kosem, but if you do already have a source of Fortunes of War in your list, I would recommend building the Dogen and then finding a place to put a, a Nemrut next, and then you're gonna have a lot of fun. Now let's talk about all the different frontline cruisers that you can build, and there are a lot of variations. First, let's talk uh, let's talk a little bit about the standard classic cruisers that you can make. And the most standard classic <laughs> cruiser you can make is the Iskandar. Uh, the Iskandar is uh, 93 points, so on the cheap and of the standard cruiser. Uh, it is very easy to pilot because it has uh, torpedoes to the front and it has two front uh, oriented heavy gun batteries. So when you combine this plus the mobility of the Sultanate, it means that it's really easy to put one or two Iskandar, get them in the range you want and uh, out of the range of the enemy. So very easy ships to pilot there a little bit uh, fragile but this is something i'm not gonna say like all the time for the sultanate it's something that is true basically all the time and the one thing that is interesting is that you can uh, replace one of the heavy gun battery with a generator for example a defensive generator or portal generator but 
mostly let's imagine a defensive generator and then for 83 points you have a ship that is uh, going to be relatively tough which is interesting for the sultanate and very agile and it will go where it wants to be so overall you can never go wrong with these kandar and you will never be like oh my god it did nothing and i paid too much for it no it is a good choice just a little bit boring one but always good then you have the Pasha talking about uh, boring. Uh, no, it's not boring actually because there is a little trick you can do. But when you look at it, it is basically an Iskandar with a little uh, gun battery to the rear and a single heavy gun battery uh, to the front. Okay. It is only 73 points, which is very cheap. Okay. Uh, it is fragile. Okay, I'm gonna stop saying it's <laughs> every ship is fragile, but it is very fast. It has Vanguard. Uh, which means that it can really go where it wants to be on the first turn and one funny thing it's uh, it can be attached to any sultanate unit uh, not only flagships so that is something interesting and the one combo that is very very interesting with it is that it does have vanguard it is cheap it is a great ship to carry a portal generator because the portals are created at, at the start of your activation so before you move and this means that the Pasha can first uh, move with Vanguard 5 inches and then uh, create a portal, which is very good for your turn 1 portal needs. And with the portal generator, it's going to be uh, 63 points only, which is like ridiculously cheap. And uh, then your opponent uh, is a little bit annoyed because uh, what do you do with it? Uh, do you uh, try to sink the Pasha, but then it's only 63 points and... Uh, do you really want to dedicate a lot of firepower for a ship that has basically no firepower? Or uh, do you li let it be and you're like, okay, whatever, but then your opponent has in your lines a ship uh, that is just going to drop portals a turn after turn after turn. So it's quite difficult to handle for your opponent. There is another ship that we'll talk about in a second uh, that is maybe even better for this role, but they uh, have different prices and different roles, but the Pasha is great for turn one uh, portals thanks to Vanguard. It's really its role, and if you need to have portals on turn one because you want to make a big alpha strike, uh, this is a ship for you. Then you've got the Sadrazam, and this is more of a brawler. Uh, it is expensive at <laughs> armor 6 citadel 10, and doesn't have that many hull points, and it costs 115. It starts to be a lot, you don't want to expose it too much, uh, though remember that even if you get 20 hits, uh, you will not suffer from double uh, citadel but still uh, 20 hits means you're almost already crippled and then you will not have that many hold points left anyway uh, it is powerful though it has a lot of guns like two heavy gun batteries to the front one small gun battery to the rear and it has heavy broadsides so they are powerful uh, but they are very fragile for their point cost, so you don't want to expose them at all. Uh, don't think that because they're kind of like the heavy cruiser that you uh, should use them to really do as much uh, damage as you can in the middle of the board. Uh, they are a good candidate to being teleported through portals. It takes a little bit of like preparations, but if you can, then you absolutely uh, should. Or bring them from the side with a strategic rival or this kind of thing. Because these guys hate to be targeted before they can do their thing otherwise very powerful but very fragile then you have the izmir uh, which is uh, basically what we said about the pasha which means that it is a very good ship to carry a portal generator it is 77 points which means it is a little bit more expensive than the pasha it does not have a rear gun battery and it does not have vanguard so eh, well, why would i ever want this well you might want this because this little boy has heavy broadsides and heavy broadsides can pack a lot of punch at point blank and it gives even more of a headache to your opponent because as we've said with the pasha your opponent has to decide like do i want to use a lot of firepower for this cheap ship that uh, will just make portals left and right which is ah, whatever in the end uh, or do I want to focus it? The Izmir makes it even trickier for your opponent because it has heavy broadside, which means that if your opponent does not deal with it, uh, then the Izmir is going to use its heavy broadside at point blank to do a lot of damage. And since it is very fast and agile, it might happen sooner rather than later. So it's very difficult for your opponent to deal about it. And even if it does use a lot of firepower to sink it, it's only 67 points. So it means your opponent has a little bit wasted its time on it. 
And then we can see what is very interesting about the Sultanate is that they can link two hulls of cruisers to make a larger catamaran style uh, ship. They call this Ikili hulls. They have some special rules. They can be even more agile and mobile. Like <laughs> it's quite gets quite silly with those, and they are very very efficient. The first one is going to be the Mehmed, and it's called a monitor, and it's very interesting. It's one per battle fleet, and it reduces uh, the disorder of ship that activates around itself. So it means it's very good to be at the center, and it's just generally very useful at the, in the middle of your fleet. Uh, first of all, it has fortunes of war. I've already talked about how important it is, and this is one of the sources of fortunes of war in your fleet. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of firepower. I mean, just have a look at the heavy gun batteries, the two torpedo salvos and everything. All right. It does cost 250 points, which is as much as some many flagships. But it does have two uh, generators. One of them is going to be a shield and then you can put another one, whichever you want. And it means it's going to be relatively tanky. Uh, and it has elite crew, so it's not that vulnerable to boarding. Uh, you can put a magnetic generator to protect it from aircraft. Like there are really a lot of things you can do to make it survivable and make it a good centerpiece for your fleet. Uh, if you build it, it's going to be maybe even bigger than an uh, Anatolia. And uh, it's just a great ship all around. Uh, but then if you do this, you don't have like two Iskandars or one Izmir and one uh, Pasha, this kind of thing. So it's really a choice in terms of uh, models because it's going to be very hard to magnetize. Um, the choice is yours. Do you like the aesthetics of the Mermaid and all these catamaran ships, or do you prefer single ships? Uh, both options are really, really playable. So you don't have to think that you have to do one or the other because they are more competitive. No, just choose what you prefer. And then you can also build the Hure, which is going to be basically a Mermaid, but with two uh, small gun batteries to the rear. And this guy is a flagship, actually. So it can lead its own battle fleet uh, for 280 points. Uh, it is a powerful ship, I mean, just look at all the firepower that it has. And uh, it gets command codes, which means you get a full reroll and ship around uh, every single turn, which is very, very good. Uh, however, it used to be uh, that I say like, yeah, build Urams because uh, you don't have that many flagships for the Sultanate and it's important, I don't know. Uh, it's a lot less true uh, today. There are a lot of different flagship options uh, for the Sultanate. There's going to be even more in the future when we start to see Egyptians and more order, etc. in Greek ships. Um, there, the, the Hurem is not as mandatory as it used to be. It is still very good. Uh, it is a good flagship, uh, tough, and um, it has a cruiser defensive stat lines, especially in terms of Citadel. It's not great at all, uh, but with all the generators you can get, um, it can be relatively resilient for the Sultanate. However, it's not going to be resilient when you compare it with its price cost of 280 points. So this is something that you need to keep into consideration. Uh, do you really uh, want to have uh, one tough flagship that has a lot of firepower but can be sunk relatively fast for its point cost? Or do you want some other flagships that are maybe a bit tankier. We will talk a little bit later in the expansions uh, about some of the other flagships you can get for the Sultanate and some of them are just absurdly tanky. So up to you again. Not a bad choice to have a Hurem, but I personally wouldn't recommend it that much. And we switch with that to the support cruisers. Uh, a lot of great options there. The Sultanate has some very, very good uh, support ships, cheap, and uh, they do a lot of stuff for their cost. Uh, the first one is going to be the Aydin. Uh, it's very cheap, 65 points. It has almost no weapon, like small broadsides. Well, it does have like broadsides and torpedoes and a little rocket battery. So it's not <laughs> defenseless, but it's not for this that you take it. First of all, first of all it can be attached to uh, any uh, net unit, which is already good. It gives you logistical support, which this is very important. Uh, like logistical support for 65 points is something that a lot of factions would love to have and pay for and the sultan has it and you can attach it to a ship and it can uh, remove disorder of ships that activate around it uh, so very good especially if you attach it to for example to an aircraft carrier uh, and then it can give the ammunition to units around which is going to be more important for the egyptians for example but it does a lot of stuff for 65 points 
and I'm not going to say it's auto include but I'm saying if you do have the model and uh, you I would recommend to find 65 points to add it because it gives you a lot for its point cost it will not sink uh, the entire enemy fleet for by itself but just for logistical support it's worth paying 65 points and then you have some weapons remote disorder you have munitions to give around like very good ship talking about good ships we have the Konya which is uh, this uh, great repair platforms for 75 points so a bit more expensive but it's gonna throw eight dices at the end of its activation and it can repair itself it can repair uh, ships around it and actually I said uh, no it's going to throw four dices and yeah I just uh, didn't remember like it, it has actually been upgraded uh, now the Konya sends uh, four dices to repair at the end of its activation for 70 five points it means that you have a good chance to repair some uh, critical damages around repair some morale or even uh, give some hull points back which is great like i mean you can attach it to a center a ship in the center of your fleet and then it's going to repair left and right amazing uh, then it has um, one third chance to repair any skiff that is destroyed within 10 inches uh, that is fine but now that they can rarely be destroyed it's not that important but even more important than that it can boost the attacks of skiffs around usually they give plus one dices per skiff at point blank this makes it plus two dices at point blank per skiff and this can be absolutely devastating some of the combos that we will see uh, involve having a flagship for example or something with four skiffs it means that it can give plus eight dices at point blank and when you start to combine that that with heavy broadsides which we roll all the blues like all the counters you're gonna start uh, very fast to have 18 dices re-rolling all counters Oof, that is going to be a lot and your opponent is not going to appreciate the joke uh, basically it's going to make a critical on anything including uh, almost any uh, battleship even heavy battleships are going to get a critical from this and of course obviously you want the Konya to be uh, as close to all the skiffs in your fleet as possible then we go to the morea the this is another cheap entry of course for 70 70 points uh, it has both mine layers and mine sweeper which is good and it has an integrated mirage generator that we can see here uh, it makes it a little bit more tanky and a lot more mobile so this is basically the ship that you want when you want to play with the mines so you will put a mine uh, for each Moria that you have which is good mines are efficient and it's so mobile that it just it can just teleport left and right and remove all the mines uh, of the table uh, in the first couple of turns so that is good uh, then it depends again uh, how much terrain do you have how, ma how many mines your opponent has because if your opponent does not have uh, any mines then the Morea is a bit wasted uh, it's not that efficient I would highly suggest to have your list with an Aydin or a Konya which is always going to be uh, very useful and efficient rather than a Morea but then it's your choice you can do what you want you will not shoot yourself in the foot that much with the Morea because putting mines is good and it has a mirror generator which makes it also efficient but it's more situational if you love the concept you can absolutely take it uh, but not my first pick and then we arrive to the big boys especially like the Mirimas uh, this is what I was talking about when I was talking about portals and some ships need portals to be efficient the Mirima has an absolutely devastating attack uh, but it can only shoot at point blank uh, but if it gets to shoot it's like one of the most powerful artillery attack in the game but again it needs some setup with the portals uh, it does cost 135 points and you do need some other sources of portals uh, it does have a little portal generator there okay but it will not be uh, it so it can create a portal for its own attacks uh, okay fine but it cannot uh, create a portal like far away next to the enemy that it needs so this is why it needs thing ships like the dogan or some other portal generator ships like the pasha or the izmir or even some other ships that we'll talk about we'll talk about other boxes you can uh, buy but basically you need to do something so it can be efficient okay sure and uh, once you do it is a very very powerful ship uh, and you would hope so because it takes some efforts to prepare it uh, but when it does work damn will it 
do a lot of damage. Uh, the cool thing is that it has Flag Barrage 5, so if you get, for example, a couple of Mirimas, uh, which is very, very um, good, like a squadron of two, uh, then it is going to be very annoying to remove them with the SRS tokens, which could be a weakness for them if they didn't have this. And uh, having Flag Barrage 10 means that some uh, air attacks will be literally cancelled. I mean, I've played uh, against some ships with Flag Barrage 10, and just the threat of knowing that on a good roll they can remove two or three uh, SRS tokens, uh, and in statistics they will remove between one and two minimum. Uh, just knowing this means that when you have aircraft carriers, you're like, okay, maybe I want to remove the Mirimas with my uh, aircrafts, but do I really want to take the risk and have the risk of uh, my entire attack being wasted this turn? Or do I want to maybe put my aircraft on something else uh, that I know will not be intercepted by the flag barrage? Just the ability to mess with your opponent's plans uh, like this is a great uh, thing to have for these uh, ships with flag barrage. So uh, overall, a very good ship. Keep it very hidden, though it is fragile for its point cost. And it's not a combat ship, but if you can manage to create some portals and shoot at your opponent, you will not regret it. And then we go to my big deception of this sort of set, the Constantinople. Uh, this ship is a, a aircraft carrier. It looks beautiful, as you can see, and I would love to use it more. However, however, um, it is fragile. It has Citadel 10, three hull points before it degrades and launches half as many squadrons. So it will get sunk fast by the first torpedo salvo that is going their way, or aircraft carrier attack, or anything. They are very, very fragile for 127 points. They are very agile, but you just want them hidden anyway. You don't want them uh, zapping around. And the big thing that plays against them is that the Sultanate has some great options as a flagship carriers. Uh, the Suleiman, the Topkapi, we will talk about it later. But they have some great, great carriers. And uh, the Constantinople just is not good enough when you compare it. If you want a single carrier in your fleet, uh, especially for either attacking enemy ships very far away or even uh, to play a little bit with your card like you have bad cards in your hand and you want to shuffle it a little bit which is very respectable you can do this absolutely well then the a single constantinople is fine but never take more than one i would recommend then we go to the nemrut the nemrut is basically what happens when you link two uh mirimas together uh, it's 244 five points which is a bit cheaper than the mirimas like if you took two mirimas uh, however uh, it loses flag barrage which is the main thing i have to say against it it is going to be uh, relatively fragile and it is very vulnerable to air attacks uh, because of that uh, which is a little bit sad but it does gain a lot uh, in the meantime first of all it gains a shield generator uh, mass 3 which is quite uh, useful to resist some of the smaller attacks of the enemy and it will even reduce a little bit the uh, larger attacks okay and it gains two uh, heavy rocket batteries which is actually quite huge like it makes it not only a good artillery ship but also makes it a ship that can uh, do some picket damage to the opponent okay fine uh, in the end it makes it more of a mixed combat slash artillery ship uh, but more vulnerable to the air aircraft carriers and it's a good alternative to the Mirimas. The Mirimas, uh, you, can, you take one or two and you stay hidden behind an island uh, with your portals the whole game long, like stay very hidden, okay? The name route can be a little bit more like further away from the enemy, like at long range, but uh, using both its artillery and its rocket and its torpedoes uh, to do quite some damage and you have uh, this extra generator, it can be uh, whichever you want. There are some uh, options, uh, some plays that you can do with it, and the choice is yours. And finally, I will talk about the Borsa and the Bayezid, uh, which are uh, also some frontline uh, squadron ship that you mix together, so not the supports. I take talk about them at the end because they're relatively new in the orbit, and uh, they are not uh, my first choice. I mean, they are fine. I didn't see them played yet, and... Uh, when I compare them to the big, uh, for example, the Mermet, for example, I'm like, do you really want it? But they are so much cheaper, so let's talk about them a little bit. Uh, they are relatively tough, especially when you compare them to the Mermet, for example. Uh, but they have like stat lines like, an, uh, like a cruiser, like the armor and the citadel, uh, and they cost a lot. But they have two generators. One of them has to be a shield generator, which is going to be mass 3, so minus 3 dice per attack, which is uh, actually quite good. Um, 
It has flag barrage 5 if you take the Borsa for 175 points, which is what I would recommend because uh, it is, as I said, fragile and it, it removes the fragility uh, compared to the enemy's air attack, so I would recommend the Bursa. And uh, I don't know, you need to try to know how it feels. It is, it has very weak armor in Citadel, but then it has some good uh, air defenses, it has some uh, generators left and right, and I'm like, will it be enough? Uh, I think it should uh, be interesting in the sense that small attacks will be completely negated uh, by the shield generator, mass 3. Uh, so your opponent will have to make big attacks to bypass the shield generators and uh, then if it makes too much on this uh, they do have a few hull points and they don't care if you make twice the citadel which can happen quite fast uh, so then they can absorb quite some firepower and they are worth a try and i would use them more as anvils so like the first line of defense keep them hidden if you can because that's is the whole some little playstyle, but more like an anvils compared to the rest of the fleet, which are glass cannons. Uh, don't consider them as tanky as a Borodino, for example, they are not, um, but they are relatively tankier than the rest of the fleet. And talking about glass cannons, we have the Temirs. Uh, Temirs are 33 points per model, they are frigates, so they are squadrons uh, from the default. They can be between 2 and 8 ships per squadron. 8 ships is huge, especially when they have so many weapons. They have a gun battery, like a, like classic gun batteries, and when you start to have 8 of them, that is going to hurt. They have light broadside, which is a bit sad, but they also have micro torpedoes. And when you combine this and this and that, it means that with their crazy mobility, they can uh, uh, slalom between islands and get at their ideal uh, range. And if they can do all their broadsides, uh, their torpedoes, and sending all their gun batteries, uh, they're going to deal a lot, and I mean a lot of damage for their cost. Uh, and uh, that is really how you want to play them. However, they are very, very fragile. They have two hull points uh, only, which is with armor 5 means they're going to pop very fast. They have still 10 anyway. Like, they are extremely fragile, but extremely agile and very lethal. So this is one of the ships, like, if you master them good, uh, you will make big headaches to your opponent, especially if you can go kind of, like, behind the enemy fleet, and then it's very hard to deal with them, and they will do a lot of damage. But if your opponent gets, uh, I don't know, to do some blast attack, for example, on them, uh, like, any type of blast attack will wipe out basically the entire squadron. Like, anything under a blast template is basically dead. So be very careful with the Timiot, but they are great ships. And then I wanted to talk just a little bit about the skiffs, the escort tokens. Uh, escorts are great always, uh, but it, for the Sultanate they can really, really help, uh, especially when you get the Konyas. Uh, they can really help uh, the, uh, the Sultanate punch above their weight class. A lot of ships can take uh, uh, escort tokens, even some cruisers, like many cruisers can take uh, escort tokens, which is very rare. Uh, which can mean, by the way, that you can have not enough uh, escort tokens. There are four in this box, uh, which is already a respectable amount, but maybe you need a lot more for your fleet if you start to want to play with Konya and uh, boost a lot of your point-blank attacks. And if you do, a little tip, I would recommend giving hull points to your um, escorts, saying like, okay, this one, I say that uh, this single escort token has two hull points, and it prevents you, like, it this way you don't have to put two escort tokens, you can just, when you lose one, for example, you go from two hull points to one hull point for your escort, and you say, look, okay, I have one less right, for this. This is a way to have uh, kind of like more escort tokens uh, available on your table, even if you don't have the models yet. And now I give you some list examples, so of course they can be moved, uh, just to give you like a general idea of uh, things you can do. Uh, with this uh, box. Uh, first, I made a learning uh, fleet, like for a little bit more than 700, 750 points, which is the default uh, low scale battles. Uh, it's with the basic classic Anatolia with two escort uh, tokens. You can remove one if you want to really want to be below 750. And an attached uh, IDIN to repair, get you more uh, cards to play with and it's going to be like basically your hammer and a very good ship and the center of your fleet. 
then two Iskanders, very classic as I said. I put Iskanders because they are uh, easy to play and you can just learn the game with them and they're always going to be good. Four Temir frigates, uh, because they are very efficient and this is how you will learn how to play the game good, because if you put them in the middle of the map they will die and if you use them good you will win, <laughs> basically, if I can sum up. And then one Constantinople, because uh, why not? Uh, it's, a, it's fragile but at 750 points uh, it should be able to survive long enough and it will be useful. Of course, hide it behind that island and just send wave after wave of uh, aircrafts. But it also uh, makes you learn about the uh, aircraft aspect of the game. And it goes very good also with the hiding and logistical support because you will have a lot of cards and you can spend some SRS tokens to change your card and like replace some cards with others. So that is going to be good as well to learn this aspect of the game. Then I made a more competitive list, if you are feeling a bit naughtier. Uh, this is going to be, I, I think, a powerful list at 750. Maybe not absolutely OP, but efficient. First, the of course, the Valid Kosem, which is a, this very good flagship, uh, with four escorts and a Konya. Uh, this thing is going to absolutely devastate anything at closing range, and even when it gets at point blanks, it's going to keep devastating everything. So if you get at point blanks, use the uh, escorts to boost your heavy broadside, and then shoot your uh, heavy gun batteries and uh, small gun batteries at the closing range at another ship, and then use your torpedoes at long range. It's just make it a firing platform. It's going to be uh, surprisingly tanky, especially against torpedoes and air attacks and boarding, etc., with all its escorts and stuff, and just all in all, a very good ship. Be careful if your enemy has gunnery uh, weaponry and stuff. It can sink relatively fast if you don't get to use your escorts, but otherwise, a uh, very good ship. Then I put the Bursa, which is this ship uh, with um, Flag Barrage 5 and an Idin also, because it's always good to have an Idin to boost a little bit the firepower and be nice. I gave two uh, D cannons to the Bursa. This way it can stay hidden behind an island be relatively safe uh, from aircrafts of your enemy if your opponent has some and uh, just uh, shoot quite uh, chillly at your opponents uh, from out of line of sight and then at turn I don't know two three when you, your enemy starts to be a bit weakened it can go out from its uh, hidden place and just charge down and use uh, your extra cards that you will have thanks to the idean to transform the D cannon into a devastating direct fire uh, weapon and then for Temirs, same reason as before, love them, and it teaches you how to play the game good. And now that we've seen uh, all about this uh, starter set, how do you expand? Like, you've played a few games, uh, you really love the Sultanate, and you're like, okay, what should I build uh, next? And what should I buy next? Or maybe you just, you know you want to play the Sultanate, and you want to buy this starter set plus something else on the side. Well, the first... Uh, big purchase that you can do, like the most massive purchase you can do, and then you're going to be all set, is going to be the Suleiman Battle Fleet set. Uh, first of all, the Suleiman is this beautiful piece of resin, like uh, such a glorious ship to have. It is very tanky, a little bit less than it used to be because it was oppressive and probably the most OP ship in the game, the Suleiman, as it used to be. Uh, we had some people making a list, competitive list of four Suleimans, that is not cool, <laughs> uh, but it's still really good. It's a mass four carriers, it's very tanky, still quite tanky, yeah, even now after all the nerfs, and it sends 12 SRS tokens per turn. That is a lot, and your enemy will have some trouble dealing with it. Then you get three extra uh, Turkish frontline cruisers, which is going to be five in total, so it allows you to make some more uh, catamaran like uh, Ikili hulls, or if you made already a catamaran hull uh, with the starter set, it allows you to get some classic cruisers on the side. Same thing with the support cruisers, you get an extra three, so it really gives you a lot of redundancy. So uh, this way you can really have a little bit of everything and it's very good. If you want to play at 2000 points or 1500 points, it's very good. You get six extra Temir frigates. Again, very good deal because uh, as we've seen, uh, as we've said, Temirs can be in the pack of eight, so this way you can really reach this easily, or make, I don't know, two packs of five, and it's, Temirs are very efficient, and it's always good to have a lot. You have six extra escort tokens, and uh, again, we've seen how good the escorts can be, and this way you don't have to make the little trick with counting the whole points to say how many tokens you have, you can just have all your escort skips on the table, and it's gonna look glorious. And uh, again, extra SRS tokens, very good as always. 
and uh, yeah cannot uh, like it's always good to have some extra SRS token so o uh, overall a very very good uh, box to complete it's basically a lot more of the same and you get the Suleiman it's if you want to have like a pure Turkish fleet it is probably the best purchase you can do but uh, it is 85 pounds which is uh, even more than the starter set uh, so you need to think like do I really want that uh, it, it is a good call, but maybe you don't want to spend an extra 85 pounds on this. I can understand, or maybe you want to do it a little bit later. So let's have a look at what other things you can have if you don't want to buy the Suleiman yet. One great ship that you can have is the Retage uh, Battlefleet. And this is actually, uh, these are ships from the Order, as we've said. It is kind of like uh, alien augmented uh, angelic uh, fighters of our order and you have the retage which is this crazy looking ship with the best portal capacity of the entire game uh, it's very good with portals uh, as you would expect from something called a portal ship uh, it has a lot of firepower it's very like surprisingly tanky but it is extremely expensive it does have fortunes of war as well if i remember correctly so it removes this from your uh, this spine for you from your foot if the expression exists in English and it's overall just a great ship but it costs a lot so maybe better to put it out in higher points game but this is a very good complement to uh, for example you will use uh, the 750 points list that we've talked about just before if you want to go to 1000 or 1500 points a Retage Battle Fleet is going to be very good helping you to do that so the retage is great, and you get four uh, Carolus destroyers, which are these little ships here. Uh, those are probably the most powerful mass one ships of the entire game, and they are actually they are actually the only mass one ships that cannot be uh, destroyed in one shot uh, when their citadel is breached. So that tells you a lot about how powerful they are, uh, but they do cost a lot as well. Plus, here you get some portal tokens, which you actually don't get uh, in the starter set. And this way you can represent physically uh, your tokens uh, with a nice little effect of transparent resin instead of having to just put an empty black token saying like, okay, my portal is there. So also good. And then also if you want to play with a uh, portal, oh, I didn't say, uh, the retage is 45 pounds, so reasonable. And the top capi is 35 pounds, one of the cheapest box you can find for... Um, for dystopian wars except if you have a look at the very small squadrons that you can buy as a support but yeah, yeah. the top capi is going to be a great box especially especially if you don't want the Suleiman because the problem is it's going to be very hard in your list to have both the Suleiman and the top capi because then it starts to be a lot of flagship aircraft carriers but if you don't want to get the Suleiman the top capi is a great alternative is basically what they call it portal strike carrier which means it can send its SRS token uh, like through portals which is very cool and fluffy but not very useful since you can send them 40 inches away anyway so maybe don't waste your portals on this but it can create portals for other ships around uh, which is actually probably the best way to play it like use your it as an aircraft carrier that is also a portal support ship uh, kind of like the Dogen would be as we've talked about earlier. You can also build it as the artillery ship version, the Nemrut, uh, if you want, with this box, uh, which is something to note uh, if you didn't have a Nemrut and you want one. Uh, you do also get two SRS tokens, okay. You do get uh, four escort skiffs on top, always good. And you get um, portal tokens, as we've said before, it's very useful. So this is... Uh, also a very good box to get and I would recommend like if you just uh, want a little bit extra on top of your uh, Sultanate starter set this is probably the first box I would take like because it's relatively cheap the top capi is going to be always useful you get some more escorts which you want and uh, some SRS token always useful as well and some portals so very good little expansion uh, for uh, your Sultanate starter set if you want that. And that is going to be it. Uh, we hope that you found this video informative. If you did, please give us a thumbs up. It really helps. Give us a comment as well. It really helps with YouTube. And it also makes me very happy, which is something nice, right? Um, I will try to answer to each and every one of you if you have any question, because there are a lot of uh, little technical, subtle things about the Sultanate. So if you have any question, do let us know in the comment. And we'll answer as fast as possible. And we will see you next time in uh, another video. And until then, take care of yourself, take care of those around you. And remember to keep spreading the love 
all around. Bye.